So guys, uh, ye yesterday you had that weird fucking uh, thing that only you guys celebrate. Uh, for those listening, we're recording on <laughs> July 5th. How was your 4th of July experience? What, what do you guys even do uh, for this sort of uh, holiday? The rest of the world doesn't celebrate it. Yeah, what are you guys doing? This is, <laughs> this is important. <laughs> Today, or yeah, yesterday, I don't celebrate it, right? Officially, I don't celebrate it. I don't, you know, I don't do anything for it. There's usually just fireworks and stuff. Everyone else is, so I'm, you know, I'm there and I'm just taking part in it by proxy. You know, it's kind of like, just like settling or whatever. It, it wasn't me, but I was there. Um, yeah, free day off. Take it when you can. Exactly. And yeah, I just hung out with some friends um, and watched fireworks and that was, that was pretty much it. Watch the city slowly turn um, from smog to like people are going to die if they have asthma and yeah that was it was fun <laughs> yeah uh here in texas we have um we've got firework stands on basically every corner outside when, when you're outside the city limits because you're not technically allowed to shoot off fireworks within city limits so i mean people do it anyway but that's the law um and last night uh we had some people we live in the suburbs and we had some people right outside our house, right outside our house, like 15 feet from our door. And we've got, you know, the babies asleep and everything. And they have these mortars, essentially, that they're launching and blowing up. And it was like <laughs> shrapnel was falling on my house. And I had to go out and go, guys, you're going you're gonna to set my house on fire. Please, like, move 15 feet towards your house. But yeah, it's it's a big thing here in Texas. I mean, people flock to these fireworks stands. I remember when I was, I don't know, 16, 17, um, you know, when your friends could just start to drive and have a little independence and stuff, because that's the only way to get around in Texas. Um, we would go to these fireworks stands and we'd spend our, our hard earned, um, summer money on massive fireworks. There was one that we got one year. Um, what was it called? It was called one bad mother, I think. And it's like a 500 gram cake. It's like a big box. Um, and it's supposed to shoot I don't know, 15, 20 little rocket things about 150, 200 feet in the air and then explode. Um, ours was defective. Oh, shit. And luckily, you know, we were, we were being smart and, and backing off after we lit each one. So we lit this one and it sat there for a second. Like the fuse went into it and then it just sat there. And we're like, do we go up to it and stuff? And then it just detonates, just explodes on the ground. And like, oh, God, if you've seen that video of um the family recently where they set off some fireworks and it like fell over and shot into their car where they had a bunch more fireworks and it set off those classic that's basically what we were dealing with luckily we were at a a, a lake so most of it like went in the water and stuff and we didn't set up a start a forest fire or anything but um it's no wonder honestly that the united states just catches fire on the fourth of july because with stuff like that like no quality control with these fireworks it is fun though but Good God, that was, I have PTSD from that. I can, I can imagine. I would expect a lot more actual, like, forest fires to be started because it's literally a country of 300 million people all at the same time exploding yeah. shit all over the place. All drunk, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> all not. drunk. Gender reveal parties, that's usually, that's a big one. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it oh, doesn't yeah. got to be 4th of July, people just blowing shit up, lighting shit up on fire. That's our birthright. Yeah, apparently. I remember my only experience with 4th of July, I was this like overworked college kid that went to work and travel to the States. I would work like 14 hours a day. And I didn't even like notice that it was 4th of July or like I noticed it was 4th of July because one of the shops I worked, everything was like discounted or whatever, especially flags with eagles and massive American yeah. flags and blue line flags and whatever the fuck. But, uh, but I never associated it with this 4th of July thing, which is arguably one of the biggest holidays days in the country so i didn't know what i was getting myself into when i finished my shift at around like 11 p.m at night and i'm getting on this little bicycle just imagine this sweaty dirty fucking little uh you know uh immigrant kid trying to get to his house to drink like two beers and and, and fall asleep and I'm, I'm, I'm riding my bike down this like a pretty like a usually not that busy type of highway but at that moment it was like completely empty and it's completely dark probably because people were celebrating uh but i didn't realize this and as i was getting closer and closer to the town where i was actually uh staying at because that shop that was the second job it was a bit outside of town that's why i'm riding a bike on the highway which i know americans are already spasming they're like what the fuck you're riding a bike <laughs> yeah. on a road I'm like yeah bikes are what is road. that yeah what's that 
but I, I just remember that specific scene of like an incredible amount of smoke on this bridge that goes into town, slowly revealing itself as my bike goes inside. And just these hordes upon hordes of people dressed in red, white, and blue, slowly moving, like be it on one <laughs> on those like Walmart fucking, uh, what do you call it? Uh, scooters or like, uh, you know, moving left and right, the whole you, the whole bridge shifting. So like, like orcs <laughs> coming out of Mordor towards me and blowing shit up above them <laughs> and it was the most surreal experience ever because i swear i was like one guy in the middle of the road and in front of me there was like a thousand people they were walking in the opposite direction and i'm one guy riding a bike directly at them and it was like what the fuck do i do what the fuck do i do and i obviously got off the bike and i slowly started moving through them which slowly was not is a massive understatement it took me like another hour and a half just to arrive uh, back to the back to the apartment because you know people would walk and then stop and then walk and then stop and everybody was weirded out why I'm going in the in the opposite direction but I swear I was the only guy in that whole crowd that wasn't uh, you know covered from head to toe in uh, in American flags and shit but uh, you know it was it, it was an interesting experience I like how you guys all like gather and experience this together etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh, but just seeing so many Americans, it's already very scary to see a lot of Americans, but to see them coming out of a fog, walking directly towards you <laughs> at 11.30 p.m. after you've done a 12-hour shift, that's something I will absolutely never, never, never forget. Yeah, surreal, it sounds like, experience. And a pretty good, in a lot of ways, uh, just like weird reduction of what America is, just hordes and hordes of people moving together, displaying patriotic tendencies and getting mad at someone for not doing uh, what they are doing. So <laughs> that's very true. Speaking of uh, like uh, getting mad about something, no, I, uh, I have like serious beef with you uh, because why are you doing this to us? Uh, JT, this dude has been uploading every day straight for the last week and it's making all the rest of us Jeez. fucking look bad. Like this <laughs> podcast is weekly and it's a fucking logistical nightmare to pull off. A fun one, but still a nightmare. And don't get me started about the, the three times a week uh, new show we do on First Thought. But again, you're out here setting a new standard for left-wing content. Uh, shit, it, shit is popping off every day. Uh, I'm going to call our fucking union. Expect a call as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I look, this is still somewhat new to me. The uh, daily upload thing, it, it probably won't last. It's mainly due to sort of my brain's tendencies to act in an obsessive manner. Once I find something that once I get into a groove, um, but also I'm not I'm not, you know, I'm not putting out essays that require reading uh and and theory and um really thinking that much uh, unlike you guys so i think it, it gives me a strategic advantage for sure but yeah i don't know like i'm honestly what's what sparked it off was i i just moved and i had to like get a bunch of stuff for um moving and it ended up the expenses ended up getting really high so towards the end of the month i was like oh shit i need to bust out like a week <laughs> yeah. straight of videos so that when that adsense hits on the 20th uh i could pay my credit card bill on the 21st <laughs> and hopefully not you know blast my credit score into oblivion and so far i mean that i like i managed to put out a video every day and that worked out but it was definitely financially incentivized but also you know it, it was a uh, sort of a uh, harken back to like when I started YouTube because when you start you, you don't really care that much yeah. about mm -hmm. about like you don't have so much uh what is it sort of um like a connection to that you don't want to release something until it's perfect like the mm -hmm. perfectionist element of which I guess comes with watching like as you get into more spaces where people are making really good stuff you want to keep the quality up to a certain level and just be like putting out your best stuff all the time um and yeah, just kind of, it was sort of acted like a, as a rejection of that. It's just like, yeah, just post a bunch and like make stuff and go through the process. And yeah, I'm feeling a lot better about it, but sorry, sorry. Uh, if, if people are, are, um, upset at the, uh, the other people not putting out as much, but honestly, yeah, you know, I think your fans will be okay. They, they like the show a lot, obviously. And I'm sure they, they are okay with waiting a week, you know? 
three things to comment on there. Number one, you just fucked up and you said that the market kind of works when it incentivizes you and you're doing more <laughs> because you you know you have to pay off your bills. Though, yeah, obviously the market works. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. When it comes to, you know, um, the choice between starvation and actually, and actually <laughs> doing more. Uh, number two, uh, please don't uh, undermine the incredibly high, incredible high quality of your of your work versus what fucking mm. video essays and, and shit. Like these are, you know, apples and oranges difficult to compare, but both carrying equal value in my uh, modest opinion. And number three, you have too much respect for your listeners and your viewers. <laughs> they don't know what the fuck is the difference between a reaction video or uh, or uh, like a three hour uh, three hour essay. It is content to consume and they will uh, you know they will base their opinion on whether a certain youtuber is, pro- is like um, productive or not based on how much output they have but that but the, like that espouses like a very interesting question because a lot of uh, a lot of uh, especially people in our sphere let's call it that way uh, kind of like intentionally or unintentionally built up a relationship with their uh, listenership is that a fucking word jt listenership listenership yep the, mm-hmm. okay listenership yep. listenership thank you very much bratemoy and they um, the particular type of relationship where you know you have certain like YouTubers that uh, it's absolutely like okay for them to post like once a year like their Patreon uh, count doesn't move their subscriber count increases etc cetera, etc cetera. absolutely chill and then there's people that you know unless they're streaming fucking 12 hours a day their uh, you know their supporters start absolutely losing their mind so yes to each their own there's many different ways you can approach this this uh, content churning machine lifestyle of ours uh it's just important to find what like really suits you and what uh what uh, you know makes you as productive as possible number one but also number two what makes it the most enjoyable uh for you as well because uh, at the end of the day i don't know if you if you ever googled top 10 like most not most desired jobs or whatever the fuck uh but Mm -hmm. uh, it is as disgusting as it is uh i think in top 10 youtuber was in there and also like influencer and blogger so you can like take three spots (laughs) uh, just from the privilege of having the when you ask kids that that's like the number it's like number one or number two that's what's crazy because it's like an indicative of what they're consuming at the rate they're consuming it and also a general disconnect with uh I mean, labor, alienation, blah, 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 but also uh, what YouTube is and, and what it actually like does, you know, I want to say mm-hmm. like one thing I've noticed in this week experiment of posting every day, it really actually surprised me in a weird way that every day people say that like loosely the same comment, some version of, um, wow, we're getting fed good. We're getting yeah. like, we're getting our yeah. slop and, and this is amazing. Keep like, not, not like keep it up, but like a lot of people also being like, um, you know, don't burn yourself out. Positive comments like mental health. We know, we know you're bipolar, so mania. Like if you're manic, you know it's all good. But the majority of people being like, keep feeding the slop. Like it's really good. That weirdly enough, over time, I've been like feeling like, oh, I don't want to post too much because then I don't want to spam people's feeds or like these weird mm-hmm. insecurities about like, oh, people. Like I don't want to annoy people with content that's not like perfect. And then I just realized, oh, like people love consuming youtube the people that love it really love it and it's not like a it doesn't have to be so precious i think so that was like kind of surprising to me but also it makes sense because like uh, there's a lot of people i watch uh, pretty consistently every time they drop and i never thought about it from the other perspective you know yeah that's true yeah i never look at when something was up uploaded it's like oh if i'm watching you know donut or something if if i'm watching a car video i'll watch like three of them in a row and i don't know when they were uploaded they could have been all the same week but you know just depends on on when i'm online that i consume the content yeah see i'm I'm very different there i'm like a third category where i have this like uh, immediate anxiety attack about when i whenever i watch something that's i don't know over a year old because my brain immediately starts saying this is probably no, no longer relevant like the, the sources <laughs> cited they're probably no longer relevant probably the data is saying something else now like and, it, and it's a fucking horrible fucking thing to do because there's some brilliant videos or just funny you know cool chill entertaining content out there that's been made more than a year or two ago but you know you you just that's just... why you don't watch content for smart people who cite sources you watch absolute slop on youtube that's what youtube is for <laughs> that's that's the entirety of my consumption it's like car stuff camera stuff i guess camera stuff does have to be timely and like the worst memes you've ever seen and that's about it i probably have like the worst consumption habit of of there's some streamers that i watch that like do league of legends videos and they post <laughs> them every other day 
and every or every day and i watch those to like learn but also to like relax and chill because it's like yeah. the content is is super like you know go to bed to it content or throw it on the mm. tv while you're eating content but i tell people that and the, the disgust and like the respect <laughs> that immediately gets lost is is understandable but it's palpable so my, yeah. uh, my respect throws my respect throws i like I, I at this point like i'm a big uh, film head and obviously i watch <laughs> an unhealthy amount of uh, film on the daily and on the weekly but i'm noticing how just uh, consuming ridiculous hours of lore videos has completely overtaken my time that i usually dedicate to you know relatively productive shit but also to like watching film uh to such an extent that i i i have days where literally 100 percent of my content consumption is uh you know fucking listening about some very niche weird uh, space marine from fucking warhammer and like his entire <laughs> life's fucking uh experience in that particular fictional universe but there's so many good lore channels out there that you can kind of you can you can experience whole new worlds uh in a much quicker and much uh, let's say dopamine uh, filled uh, rate than you would ever by you know uh, consuming a whole book or, or you know or even watching like a three four part movie or three four season uh, fictional world etc cetera, etc cetera. so it, yeah imagine how much more like well-rounded smart like culturally conscious just cooler in general have way cooler stuff to talk about at parties if you spent the time you spent consuming <laughs> slop like reading books watching movies doing that consi like literally i feel like i would be a superhuman but instead i'm yeah. just you know my my <laughs> brain was degenerated and that's all that i got from it i'm still hard stuck gold four in league too i didn't i didn't get better from all this stuff you know <laughs> no, no, whatever no, 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 we, don't, we discussed this many times at this podcast the um being better or being cool or being good is the, the, one of the most subjective fucking things ever so in order for you to become cooler in your friend group you just need to find a friend group that is to the same rate as obsessed with the degenerate shit that you're obsessed with, for example, <laughs> you know, because my my people, we can we will sit down and after the fourth beer, we will spend like an hour and a half talking about fucking who's better, bro. Fucking you should you serve chaos or you know the god emperor, bro. We're like space fascists, bro. <laughs> like literally, like it's it's uh, so you know it depends on the on the environment you're in. So in certain environments, so, you know, knowing everything about the last patch for legal of legends is uh you know the coolest fucking thing ever and in another group you know i don't know you need to talk about sport ball or something look whatever group that i'm with we could be talking about smash or magic and like within 20 minutes we're talking about which public figures need to face the wall so <laughs> i don't know what that says about me <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to a very special episode of The Deep Program. Today we have a sex symbol of the online left, the crusher of toxic masculinity, the gentle bro, the smooth-voiced titan, Noah Samson, joining us right now. Oh, and arguably the number one mustache we've had here. You're cutting it very close to lol overruled, <laughs> but uh, I honestly prefer your thickness and really hope he doesn't hear this. Anyways, welcome, <laughs> Noah. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, could you please tell the audience a little bit about yourself before we begin? Yeah. Um, what's up, you guys? I'm super psyched to be here. First of all, big fan of everybody's work here. Um, yeah, I'm Noah. I do. Lately, I've been doing a lot of slop, but I do. I do kind of uh, social internet commentary stuff from a left perspective. And yeah, I've done a lot of covering the manosphere and online. Just basically a lot of weird regressive shit. Um, whether it's like political or um, anti woke, anti SJW stuff. I've been looking at a lot of that lately. Um, just kind of looking at the dweebs that make that stuff and making fun of them. Well, also I've been trying to get better at arguing against them, but for the first year of content, it was just dunks, which is still fun. You know, it's a good, it's a fun thing to do, but, um, yeah, that's my content and happy to be here. We are very glad to have you. Uh, all the links, et cetera, et cetera, are going to be in the description for the people clicking off right now. 
and for the people coming back after having clicked off, let's start out with a topic you've covered top to bottom brilliantly, if I might add, the manosphere, as people online know it, or the angry, pissed off, misdirected males, as the rest of the world calls it. A malignant tumor grown out of a larger reactionary cancer, pushing people away from looking at the real, systematic causes of their alienation and directing them towards quasi-philosophical explanations of why nothing is quote-unquote right anymore. In this case, our target of choice are those blasted women or females in the in Reddit speak. So uh, Noah and I know this is a pretty open-ended first uh, question, but bear with me. Why do you think like the type of guy attracted to this sort of ideological current uh, feels like he's being screwed over? It's it's a lot of different things. I think economics, dating and, and alienation from relationships, not just with, I guess, women and a lot of, it's cishet, most of it. So you're talking about straight people. Um, with that, there comes like, at the same way, a disconnect from people, like a lack of community, a lack of real world community. People are online more, people are not socializing as much. And from that antisocial sort of world, it's really easy to fall into um, these things and, and also be consuming it kind of on your own without ha without people in your life knowing that you're deriving ideas mm -hmm. from that until mm -hmm. the ideas come out and then they're you're they're just like oh he's weird now or yeah. oh he's like like my little brother it used to be cool but he says weird shit and like people will pick up on that when they watch you know these videos or when they watch videos that debunk them be like oh like these behaviors have manifested mm -hmm. and usually it's yeah i mean a lot of it is like young people stumbling on it and not having any sort of context in which to understand it as regressive as well as yeah like for the sort of you know uh, adult and older crowd a a certain identification with the frustrations of like dating and also the unexamined elements of of insecurity and the need to obviously find meaning somehow and you know with self-help stuff that can be one way to find that but also there's so much bad that comes with it that some people find meaning in the bad as well so mm -hmm. it's it's sort of multifaceted but i think a lot of shit is going bad basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't it super weird? It happened to me actually a few times and now the way you phrase it, uh, I started thinking about uh, just how many times it happened when, you know, IRL friends, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, or acquaintances or even cousins, brothers, sisters, rarely sisters, but uh, that, you know, you, you think that they are relatively normal, you think that they uh, don't hold, uh, let's call them bigoted kind of uh, ideological positions and so on. And then it just, uh, you know, you, you start getting red flags here, red flags there. And at one point, uh, you know, after, you know, the third drink has been drank or I don't know, they're a bit more tired or uh, they feel more comfortable around you. They slowly start uh, revealing just uh, how like, um, you know, what their their stance on particular things uh, is like. And I feel like with this whole like red pill shit, et cetera, et cetera, it's still not taboo enough for people to really be hiding it. I don't know, maybe in the States it, it is, but uh, just the number of times, I don't know, a person like Andrew Tate was brought up in a conversation in a room where I'm like surrounded by 10 plus dudes. The number of times half of them reacting with like utter and complete cringe while the other five like immediately go like, yeah, man, he actually sometimes cringe, but Sam sometimes has really good points. Sometimes it's very, yeah. it's, it's just very, very interesting to see, you know, develop, developing in your, uh, in, in kind of the community around you that you never really considered uh, uh, as people who interact with this type of online content. But it's grown to such an extent and it's become so absolutely uh, massive and like mainstream, I would even argue, that uh, that I guess it reaches even your, I don't know, redneck cousins that you didn't even know had yeah. fucking internet. <laughs> I feel bad for, for younger people these days because, you know, they've got cameras pointed in their face at all hours of the day. They're constantly there's a record of all the stupid stuff they say so like it's it's very easy to fall into these kind of pipelines like i remember when i was um you know the age of some of these people like probably i don't know high school ish age i kind of fell into the the angry atheist pipeline 
and that ah, classic. is a very yeah, it's a very easy funnel from there to like anti SJW stuff. And so some of that rhetoric was weaseling its way into my mind, and I it took a w- little while before I was able to recognize that. And thankfully, I did. I was like, okay, hold on, this is not correct. Why? Wh- how? How did this happen? How did I get from here to there? And it's just become so much more of a problem these days because it's become incredibly lucrative and people like Andrew Tate are taking advantage of that to an extreme degree. Um, Ben Shapiro, uh, Jordan Peterson, all of those people that's, you know, a a strong, a quote unquote, strong male figure. um, That's a very lucrative market to be in. Yeah. And and, and it being digital, like uh, gives it another angle because, you know, for since the dawn of man, you had your grandpa or your dad saying super racist and super sexist shit. But you would look at him and like, what's this fucking old guy talking about again? And you, you know, you disregard it because it's not cool to listen to dad, right? But now you have these uh, digital, you know, manly men who are giving you advice. And because it's coming from the internet, because it's relatively edgy, because it's uh, kind of seeped in what term should I use? Uh, online culture. It's okay to listen to them based basically saying the same thing that uh, your older uh, siblings or older you know parents uh, the bigoted shit that they would be saying anyways but that you wouldn't have listened to uh, back in the day so in a way in a way because of this thing existing kind of slows down the progressive rejection of young people of old and dying uh, dying ideas because there's a new model through which those ideas are pitched to them which they do not consider cringe at least until they don't watch uh, uh, or read stuff like what noah makes and then they realize that okay actually what the fuck was i what the fuck was i doing i think everybody had like at least like for like 20 minutes uh when they watch at least the first video have something click for them when they first interacted with uh with any let's call it like manosphere red pill content and so on but then depending on uh how much uh you know uh, pers- what kind of a perspective particular people had uh it took between 20 minutes and for some people five years to realize that what they're consuming is fucking uh, absolute dog shit yeah i think um one thing you said about all of these ideas being uh, very connected with older generations. That also, I feel like even if you aren't taking seriously, a lot of that will seep into your mentality because, you know, you'll be hanging out with a group of young men and maybe they weren't as aware in how to, like, take uh, that information with a grain of salt and not let it channel into their minds. I mean, Mm. as if, you know, there's we don't understand that a lot of young men are you know deeply sexist deeply racist deeply misogynistic based on their environmental factors which is usually a huge part of it but then for you to like be able to fully remove that from your socialization is so difficult that when Mm -hmm. you see a video that's in that accessible manner that's saying kind of the same things maybe with less direct language or maybe with more um getting this to rile you up against a group, then it becomes instantly, that's why it's so popular. It's it's just uh-huh. instantly, that's why a YouTube short will pop up and it'll be saying something about the purity of women. And you'll be like, at first you're like, that's kind of weird, mm-hmm. but also maybe, you know, there's some truth to it because X, Y, Z. And that right there is a product of environment. Because if you see it, I guess it's product of environment, but also if it's the, if the first thing you ever watched was like a fresh and fit clip on TikTok, you'd be probably pretty fucked because you have nothing, <laughs> you have no frame of reference, and mm. and that uh, attitude is is usually the default in society. Like that's like misogyny, racism. Those are outside of sort of more left communities. That those are the default. Even if you don't think it, like there's racist leftists, there's homophobic people that don't have it all figured out all at once. So it's it's just, it's too easy. It's too mm. already there. The, the framework is already laid in. Absolutely. Would you, would you use that same explanation as to why um, when in the format of like content, it's like our algorithm, be it the one in our mind or the algorithm of uh, YouTube, Twitch, fucking Twitter or whatever, uh, why it's uh, it's just so uh, like, you know, a smell that you smell and that it smells disgusting, but you can't stop smelling it. Why is it just so attractive to to all of us, even to, to, to those of us who kind of know what they're getting themselves into when, you know, you see that thumbnail, you see that, you know, red headed woman or purple haired woman posted like right in the middle as uh, as they're expressing emotions and so on with a super clickbaity title and you know exactly what the fuck you're getting into 
but you still fucking click. Uh, so is it just linked to as you as you beautifully put is it linked it's mostly linked to uh you know this in, in a lot of internalized misogyny that some people are conscious of some people are are not because of the different life experiences that the, that they've had but isn't it also in a, in a very fucked up way kind of like like self redeemingly entertaining because you 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 don't only want to confirm your own biases, be it biases that uh, you're conscious of or biases that you're not conscious of, but just the the darkness of those sorts of arguments of that type of content uh, is 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 uh, uh, like the, the the forbidden fruit that you kind of want to at least see what it's uh, what it's about. At least that's how I explain it to myself why it's uh, uh, always attractive. Be it, do you want to watch it because you want to cringe and you want to get pissed off? Because very often, like, let's be honest, I anger watch like fucking crazy. I see like something super, super stupid. It's obviously going to be stupid. And I watch it and it gives me fuel, it gives me fuel, gives me fire, gives me that which I desire. What fucking song was that? But it, and it pushes me, and, you know, and it motivates me even more to. Uh, to make the shit that I make to to kind of fight against it, and I'm pretty sure it's for people that are out. That it's similar for people that are outside of uh, you know our quote unquote job, if you can call this a job, um, as well. It's just uh, wanting to see a disaster from whatever like ideological perspective is always kind of uh, uh, attractive in a in a dark way. Yeah, I think that actually ties into like uh, the new atheist stuff because it's it's like a a politics based on nothing other than domination. So like mm. seeing someone get epically owned, uh, mm -hmm. the Ben Shapiro compilations mm -hmm. are so prominent and such like a building block of the online space where even even left content, like if something gets really fit, like a Sean video that thoroughly debunks some dumb content, those are my favorite videos. And that on its own, it like hopefully will lead you to understanding the politics of like first off why regressive stuff is bad but then next why progressive left more community oriented ideas are good and so if your foundation if you never get to that point you're it's it's like the junk food of oh this is like i love seeing someone get owned and and the the manifestation of that for so long on the internet since you know gamergate and before is it's an sjw it's a purple haired girl that's getting owned and then you realize then you sort of develop the notion mm -hmm. the notion that the purple haired girls are always saying some dumb shit because the only time you ever see a purple haired girl is when they're saying some dumb shit so mm -hmm. it, it just builds on itself but yeah i think that that taboo nature of the experience of the content for sure 100 plays into it like it's not just you know oh i'm divorced i like seeing women be dumb because i'm mad at my ex-wife it's right. like oh no this also serves a purpose of entertainment and indulgence that goes beyond how it connects directly to the experience because it's served right to you on an algorithm you know absolutely and why do you think that uh, it's directed uh, at least for me, it's an interesting question. Why is it so directed at uh, at women? Is it because they're an easy target, or or something else? I think um, it's it's been remarked before that misogyny is the most through lined form of bigotry mm -hmm. uh, throughout yeah. like history and societies and time, basically because of how there is no entry level bigotry a low low level big entry level low level, low level yeah bigotry. exactly you don't need it's DLCs, like it's you like don't, you need to buy like advanced racism anti-semitism you, you right you have to acquire items bigotry, for that yeah when you buy the game of bigotry is misogyny sorry please continue <laughs> no no yeah um it's it's foundational because of obviously just communities aren't like you, you if you live in a predominantly white community your racism is going to form, but it's going to manifest in a different way as a lack of exposure. But that community will have women in it, and those women will be doing things that you might not like sometimes. And that can immediately spawn, obviously, aside from the direct actions, but like the socialization of your parents and your parents' parents and how these attitudes stem from patriarchy, blah, blah, blah. I think that is what makes it so easy is that there's a direct through line with the content to real life and your own experiences that you might not have with other things. And so, yeah, I think the direction towards women, while it often intersects between also race and also gender and like transphobia, blah, blah, blah. There's just such an, such a, it's such a natural response to some for, for like a young man to have because of proximity I, is, yeah. is what I would say. But I think there's probably other factors too. 
Absolutely. Everybody at some point interacted with a woman. Women are around 50% of the population. One ends up hurting you in one way or another because they're an outer group that you don't identify with because, you know, you're usually a cis straight dude. Uh, it's a, the perfect excuse for you to start uh, generalizing absolutely all of them. Then some content pops up online. It's, oh my God, kind of doing the, the same thing and sharing experiences that co-align with, uh, with your own. But instead of saying that, oh, maybe this particular individual that you interacted with was a piece of shit because they're just a piece of shit, not because they're a woman. But no, all women are bad. And then everything starts clicking together. And then, you know, you're, you're 35 and you're wondering why you're never getting laid. Uh, but uh, that's a that's a that's a different conversation point. No, that that was very well put. Uh, as someone, for example, from a part of the world which is usually most of the countries are pretty monoethnic, let's call it that way. And even though I'm an immigrant in the country I live in and so on, still like ethnically and culturally, I'm pretty relatively similar to the to the local people. Uh, except like you know what Eastern Europe Europe in general is famous for you know deep hatred for the for the Roma. The next like topic that is absolutely never taboo, misogyny is pops up and it's not even seen as uh, anything wrong to such an extent that you know there's we people will jump from talking about i don't know their car tires to uh you know hey them uh, the, all those uh, slur 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 against women etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, i guess uh you know the the, the people churning in the reactionary content machine sometimes be it consciously or not consciously uh wisely you know you gotta respect the enemy understood you know it's the, the women are the easiest fucking target because absolutely all are males which is kind of our audience at one point uh uh, has stereotyped them, uh, grouped them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's the whole joke about you know if the Nazis had won, you know it started with anti-Semitism, hatred towards Slavs, you know people of color, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as the whole world would be quote unquote purified more and more and more and more and more, once everything is killed except you know the perfect Nordic German. You know, 300 years into the war, the joke is that they will eventually start murdering the women as well. They will create like a, like a you know, a gay Nazi empire because women would be the next like inferior creature that needs to be removed from the equation in order for the superior male cis guy to be to be on top. And obviously, I was joking. They wouldn't go gay. They would like make some robots that make kids or whatever. But uh, it's it's just just the, hanging the, with the boys. Just hanging with the boys, <laughs> <laughs> but, with, but with a swastika spin to it. But yeah, women don't get like, I know it's three dudes here talking about uh, women, but uh, it's just so easy, so fucking easy to uh, to pick on a woman, especially in like cow in a cowardly way where, you know, you're sitting in a room or in front of a microphone even more cowardly when there's not an actual other woman in the in the room itself. But uh, women aren't always the, the main target of this type of content. Uh, sometimes and very often the men themselves are, uh, they've managed to kind of commodify stuff like fitness, fashion and confidence, which they then spat out like some sort of weird ass guru motivational instruction manual on how to become a quote unquote better man, more successful, more attractive, more alpha. I always like vomit a bit in my mouth when I hear the fucking word. But uh, that 2000, you know, tens uh, quote, I don't have swag, I have class meme, uh. but personified as an ideology. Uh, and as much as, you know, it's funny, but it, 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 it works and it works well as a pitch to people, at least because it's it's simple. You know, they tell you do A, B, C, D, E, F, G and your life will significantly improve. Uh, it all still revolves around the most, you know, matrixy matrix behavior, even though they say they're outside of it, which is accumulation of shit you probably don't even care about, you know, bodies, money, material possessions, and so on, is the most, you know, non-philosophical philosophy, basically tell you, telling you, be obsessed over the shit 95% of people care about, and that'll somehow make you better or happier. Uh, but what is, what is it that, you know, these manosphere influencers did different to more old school, traditional, you know, LinkedIn cringe style motivational speakers? You mentioned a few a few aspects of it before, but if you want to expand on it, uh, my man. Yeah, it's like a, a reframing of self-improvement, quote unquote, for yourself. That 2010s era, grind, cold shower, wake up, do a thousand push-ups or whatever. 
reframing that, adding in the element of you're doing this thing beca to become a high value man. And when you become a high value man, you gain access to women who you can fuck, who you can date. And eventually, if you can find one that's a virgin, who you can marry and have <laughs> kids with and keep her in the house. So like it's it's this it's this extreme hearkening to all of these deeply socialized feelings about women and about dealing with rejection, which is a totally you know, it's something that happens to every person. Mm -hmm. But then that is reframed as you are being robbed of your uh, or this is because of your inferiorities and this is because you're not good enough and the way to get good is to get a Bugatti or whatever. Like that's yeah. that it's that basic pipeline. And I think that draws so quickly and easily among men that 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 the market followed, obviously, like it became way more lucrative to do fresh and fit stuff than to do, you know, whatever pre like red pill. Mm hmm. Um, self-improvement content was because it just doesn't like self-improvement there's obviously a ton of self-improvement influencers out there they don't do the types of numbers that these guys do because they're drawing on of and such a deeply ingrained uh force for these men like it's it's so deeply ingrained that and it's so easy to prey on insecurities that that yeah it's it's like the evolution was determined as soon as they realized how much money it could make. And then now it's prevalent. And now not only is it is it like drawing on insecurities, it's turning around and affecting people in the real world um, beyond themselves because, yeah, they're taking these meds. You read the stories all the time of a girl be like, yeah, I went on a hinge date. This guy started talking about being a high value man. Mm -hmm. I fucking mm -hmm. zoomed out of there. <laughs> but also uh, that's fucking weird. And then, yeah, you're like, well, that seems to be happening more and more because it's a really prevalent online culture because it makes money. It's, it's, isn't it so ironic that a, a whole, uh, again, I keep using this fucking term, it's cringe, but I'll still use it, ideological current, which is about, you know, quote unquote, empowering men and so on, at least how it pitches itself, is at the end of the day, so obsessed with women, obviously in a disgusting misogynist way as women as currency, but, you know, the, the whole reason, okay, so you want to become a high value man. How do you become a high value man? You know, the Bugatti, the money, the houses, the... Uh, you know, the gold, the whatever. But why do you want to become a high value man? And most often the, the, the answer is, you know, to get the the virgin who somehow is also incredibly good at bed, et cetera, et cetera. Like the, the ultimate goal, the, the currency that they want to kind of uh, possess is a woman and yet they are pitching it as a as a as a system which is supposed to empower men and yet you know the the the, the main thing that the whole kind of ideology at the end of the day revolves around is getting a woman is getting to interact with uh, with a woman but isn't it super weird like how do they after like one hinge date or two hinge dates where you're sitting down and you're talking about yourself as the as a high value male or whatever and those like dates obviously don't go well how do you not like achieve at least some sense of uh what's the term self consciousness self understanding and and realize that okay this this sort of approach this sort of fucking thing that I'm doing is absolutely stupid and I should stop uh, or do they and this is what I suspect probably the kind of half, of the half answer would be uh, they just tell themselves you know this woman isn't a high value woman that can <laughs> that that that, uh, that deserves me or whatever the fuck and I need to start uh, you know, um, looking more through the through the market through the dating marketplace in order to find a woman that can actually appreciate a man of my stature and my level, et cetera, et cetera. Like basically, what I'm asking is why? Like it sounds so unsustainable because you know you fuck you use this sort of approach. You fuck up a few times. You don't get laid or you don't find like a like a soulmate, et cetera, et cetera. Why do you continue using it when, like, obviously on paper it doesn't, it doesn't fucking work? How 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 does it self sustain? I don't know. I think for the for like a lot of people or a lot of men, it's like that date's done. You conclude she was a bitch and you dodged a bullet because mm -hmm. she wasn't cool with the Andrew Tate stuff. But also, I think this leaves out a, a pretty big element, which is that at least the early pickup artist red pill guys like the guy who wrote the game i forget it, i forget his name he's still I th rollo tomasi or something the the formulaic way of like picking up girls and dating them it, it for a lot of people actually works and it doesn't involve like the obscene misogyny of an entity it's under its underlying mm -hmm. you know goal purpose is attaining and subjugating right but it's still less 
on its face and less, uh, what's the mm -hmm. word, mask off. And so for a lot of men, that, that actually works. And I think that's like something that really has to be acknowledged. And I, I think for me, because I follow like a bunch of left-leaning people on Twitter, I'm, I'm inundated with those weird stories of those hinge states that go bad. But for as many of those as there are, there's just as many people that, you know, are less, they put the mask on and they know how to navigate the situation. And then they still end up hooking up with the girl. They still end up going on more dates and getting into a relationship, even though they have the same beliefs. They're just more sort of socially adept in, in identifying that Andrew Tate is is like the sex trafficker that's in prison that also says extremely misogynistic thing that's covered in the national news. Maybe don't say that you like him and get mad at women when you when they don't agree with that. But you can also have all of his same beliefs and just not talk about him and then get laid from that. And so that's kind of the scary part, I guess, mm -hmm. um, is that it, it often does work. And that is part of why it's so popular and has to be challenged at that level initially which is it's hard to do you know it definitely is uh, and it makes one wonder is there is there like a woman's red pill community uh, or you know th that uh, trad wife shit only uh, by the way side gig idea for all the, all the reactionaries <laughs> listening in case uh, in case there isn't and in case there actually isn't and it's only the trad wife thing if you want to tell uh, some of our audience what the fuck that is because uh, that was fucking when I went down that rabbit hole. That is that is uh, I'll use the word uh, interesting to say the least. Yeah, trad wives are an interesting phenomenon for sure. Just the social media trend of of returning to um, a more yeah, traditional no, 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 role. A bit yeah, return to monkey. monkey. Return to <laughs> kitchen and monkey and uh, chained to the oven. And so I think it's like it obviously draws on a lot of traditionalists like. I think it's the more um, fertile ground for that is someone that grew up with a sort of normative, like cishet normative. Um, I don't like using terms like that because it's like if one of them heard it, they'd explode. But like just yeah. like a mom and dad, mom yeah. stays at home, stay at home mom, like traditional setup like that, traditional like patriarchal setup. I think it's it's really easy to be like, oh, that actually... I grew up with a good life and so let's consume this content because it, it connects with a sense of identity around that and if they're mm -hmm. not um privy to like conversations of social justice or feminism and about reclaiming autonomy blah 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 then that on its own doesn't necessarily have to be insidious it's like just popular because in one respect is popular because there's a market for marketing traditionalism but at the same time obviously What's being upheld there is a is a sense of domination that for a lot of the influencers that do this, it goes beyond just, you know, this is a choice that you're making to stay at home. It goes into, you know, the women who don't do this are lesser and yes, the yeah. women who aren't like acting in the manner that adheres to this worldview are you know, sluts or their Korea women that are never going to get like it, the trad wives don't say this, but it connects perfectly with red pillars that do. And so, you know, I think some in some regard, like TikToks of women wearing the floral dress and baking a cake is pro is for sure fine. But ultimately, you know, an argument that that is sort of OK to proliferate or that that is um, that there's no undercurrent of patriarchal worldview is just silly. And and I think it's still ultimately like even a feminist argument of, you know, if a woman stays home and chooses to adhere to traditional values, that's fine yeah. um, for a lot of people. It's like choice feminism. Right. So saying, mm -hmm. you know, you're choosing to do this and that is your choice. And that therefore is sort of an autonomous decision when. I think for a lot of people, that's the case. And I think the, 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 what the left could do better is to acknowledge that being a traditional setup isn't inherently bad. Of course. I think acknowledging the structures, though, it's difficult to do, but you have to acknowledge the structures as well as, as, as like how that plays into historical relevance and how those things are not far removed at any time from a traditionally set up relationship. It's like, yeah, you can be choosing this and you can be having a quote unquote good relationship, but the moment you want to like, go shopping and your allowance isn't enough uh and there's a conflict over it is when you're like oh, okay like this pro there's like things that restrict your autonomy here that you might be okay with obviously if it's it's if it's a mutual agreement but i think what the left is doing is trying to acknowledge the structure and deconstruct it and yeah sorry i totally ranted about that but it does it's the trad wife thing and i guess that's that I think it might be kind of important also to note that there's not a whole lot of daylight between 
the trad wife red pill thing and like straight up old school fascism because they're kind of adopting a lot of them are kind of adopting this vibe where there is kind of like a a rural utopianism to it where they separate from the dirty cities and stuff like that and you see these you know look at if you look at old nazi propaganda posters you see the the beautiful blonde dress wearing wife with the beautiful blonde child and you see the dad with you know going to work or, or fighting for the country or whatever and that the combination of those two elements of the trad wife thing and of the high value man um, that are both kind of in their own way fighting against what they perceive as degeneracy is a very easy single goose step to mm-hmm. becoming a Nazi. A hundred percent. That's a great point. Yeah. I, I forgot to touch on that. Like all the trad wife influencers, the, the ones that are popular anyways, are white and blonde or white and yep. brunette. And and that's not like a coincidence that like the career woman is stereotype is like a black woman that's the independent black woman that's like going and doing her own thing and and she is obviously is like too pretentious or whatever to actually find a man blah 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 it's it that's the framework that's being laid down and yeah that's a fantastic point that like people have touched on in in videos that i've seen about that the aesthetics like the fascistic yep. aesthetics of a blonde woman baking liking her position in society and yeah, I think, yeah, that's a great point. That, 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 that's where the power of fascism kind of lies in, that, you know, leftists are basing, you know, most of their analysis and worldview on, uh, on you know, the material uh, reality on the ground, while the fascist does not necessarily need to do it. And the fascist can attach his ideology to many other, like, um, let's call it uh, social aspects of life. I mean, we've seen, for example, COVID vaccines all of a sudden becoming a massive, like, right or left uh, ideological issue. And that limitation, uh, basically, for for a fascist, except for when the discussing class doesn't uh, doesn't exist i mean they can take what we were talking about previously you know self self help etc self improvement uh, which you know not necessarily a, a a bad thing to do you know go work out uh, try to you know grind away so you can feed yourself and your family and so on but then they take uh, one thing that is you know relatively noble and they add to it the aspect of in this case domination so yes improve yourself so on so on but why in order for you to be able to dominate because everything that matters in life is hierarchy and everything that matters is who fucking eats who you know you know, they add this little thing to it. Same with, for example, you know, nothing wrong with with a particular uh, woman wanting to pursue the, you know, the, 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 I don't like calling it the traditional lifestyle, but let's say, you know, uh, taking care of the home, taking care of children and not pursuing uh, what we define as a, as a career and so on. But then the fascist sneaks in that, you know, uh, men need to insist on their women being like that because that way they will not become, and I'll, you know, disgusting shit, trigger warning, but, you know, degenerates that cheat, that uh, betray the race, that uh, uh, no longer appreciate you what you as a male do for the family that don't know their place etc etc so it's it's not letting the woman choose what kind of life they want to pursue it is uh it is camouflaging uh, as that but indirectly saying not very not indirectly very directly at later stages obviously of of the ideological brainwashing that she is she needs to be told what to do because the woman is not uh, is not a man and cannot uh, you know be wise enough to make decisions on her own and will be manipulated and then you know we go into by the Jew by the this by the that yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but 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 again that's the power of uh, of fascism it can attach itself to absolutely everything it can attach itself to ridiculous stuff like you know working out to like relationship relationships inside of the home between uh, between people to I don't know uh, how many horsepower your fucking car has because if it's not over 300 you're a cuck which by the way you are if that makes me a fascist i'm sorry <laughs> but uh, no, uh but uh but yeah yeah it's uh it's super fascinating but it, it, in you know in our kind of era of fascism trying to reinvent itself it's very fascinating that it uh, it went through the path of uh you know, sexually frustrated men, let's use that term. But, uh, you know, the three of us here, I presume, never really had much of a problem with dating as adapted to, you know, obviously our local cultures and circumstances. Uh, For example, I used to be a brutally nerdy teenager and was, you know, an extremely late bloomer when it came came to women, when it came to dating, 
sexuality, all that. So I understand how fucked up loneliness can feel, but that's kids. And when it comes to adults, it's really difficult for me to comprehend how they could be so lost that they would jump on these uh, red pill bandwagons. Sure, there really seems to be a wider epidemic of fruitless dating experiences for many reasons, be it because women can actually pick their partners now or because we swap each other out like spare tires in the eternally competitive dating market, which again, makes me vomit in my mouth to call looking for a soulmate a fucking market, but okay. Uh, and it's not just that, you know, you, you've consumed and analyzed so much content built and targeted at lonely people. So why do you think it, it feels like we're all, I don't know, more fragmented than we ever were, even though there's more sex being had than ever at the same time? I guess to, to the thing about the dating thing, about like, empathizing with alienation it's like such a human experience to be rejected to feel awkward to feel like you're not good enough uh to feel like you can't do what the like the the men around you that you see being successful or being cool or being like attractive and enticing and funny to women if you aren't that inferiority is immediately spawned and so from that inferiority, you can go a number of different ways. If you don't have people in your life that can direct you into a good way, then it's super easy for the red pill stuff to happen. But also it goes further than that in terms of alienation, like economics, where you are so disconnected from meaning, your life is so disconnected from meaning and community that you're trying to find that somehow in work uh, or in, I guess, other ways that aren't going to pan out in the long term necessarily mm -hmm. for a lot of people it's going to be life is not going to be easy and so i my situation growing up was i think similar at certain points where i was definitely like a little more antisocial a little more awkward in elementary to middle school i think i was pretty poorly like socialized and as i i, I started playing sports i kind of got around people that I liked and that just by proximity, you're always with people, you're playing sports with, you're always with your team. And so from that, you know, relationships form. But with that was such a sort of a lot of times like very were the boys type of mentality that finding meaning in relationships was less about actually finding meaning in relationships and connecting. It was about like getting sex, being the guy who got sex, being the cool, funny, hot guy, adhering to that construct. And I think that like obviously is like a very different experience than a lot, what a lot of people experience. It's kind of like, honestly, it's it's the end goal of, mm -hmm. of a lot of red pillars is to do that and be in that competitive space. But once you get there and, and from my experience of it, it was not good. It, like my ability to form relationships, like real meaningful relationships has been scarred by that mm -hmm. and by that like coming to of age with those kinds of thoughts. And so that ties in, I think, for a lot of people with the sense of alienation, where if you're on the opposite end of it, it's just disconnect. It's like, I think community is the biggest thing is the lack of community leads you there. So many people like even start relationships with their colleagues because there's absolutely nobody else that they can meet except new people at work. Uh, so many people that start relationships then, uh, you know, end up being only with that person for the next 15, 20 years and that relationship for one reason or another doesn't work out and they realize that they do not have any, like, non-romantic relationships at all. Like, dudes have stopped having friends, like, generally. Uh, at least not as, as many as before or as uh, uh, directly linked as before. Uh, closely linked as before. Um, the, 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 the continuous kind of disenfranchisement, uh, be it with your, your workplace or your, you know, or your fellow worker, quote unquote, or just people in your direct surrounding is, uh, is extremely worrisome because it, it's like, it's a self-feeding, uh, self-replicating, uh, uh, snake, you know, lonely people make more lonely people. Uh, lonely people have uh, children, which they also uh, turn into lonely people. And then, you know, these lonely people, the only places where they can actually interact are online. And then very often those online spaces 
uh, move them towards uh, ideolo- ideologies like the ones that we've uh, we've talked about before uh, before today, and uh, then those ideologies tell give them a sense of community, but uh, at the same time. Uh, they make them uh, more incapable of ever creating uh, a true community, you know, in uh, in the physical uh, real world. And it's uh, and it's just uh, at least to me unnerving because I see so many of, of my direct acquaintances, some very very close friends, which. Uh, are you know reaching a certain kind of age where they absolutely feel like that they at least should have had a pretty you know decently long or stable relationship with uh, with someone uh, you know talking about women and men and yet they uh, they have been uh, cut short uh, not necessarily because of their lack of trying but because uh, there's a lack of people kind of willing to go down that uh, down that path because either they were uh, they were hurt before or as we said they don't have time for something like this or they are constantly spammed by uh, you know so many alternative dating uh, opportunities uh, which kind of turn something that's supposed to be relatively sacred uh, you know trying to find someone who fits for you and trying to be a good partner and, and a loving care uh, husband, wife, and so on and so on, or partner, you know, no, it doesn't have to be marriage, blah, blah, blah. But um, it, it's turned it into just this, this competitive fucking thing where, you know, you're basically playing a video game where you want to, like, uh, amp up your stats and you're looking at... Uh, Sexual market value exactly. is one of the terms that also makes me puke. SMV, they just use shorthand SMV, but yeah, it's horrible. Sexual market value. So is a sexual market value different to uh, if you're a high value man or not? So is it only linked to the, like how phys- how hot you are, you know, how big the tits are, how big the dick is, or <laughs> or does it include? It's a, <laughs> it includes all of it, like it, because your access to sex is predicated on having money and having status, and which again, this is a lot of this is like a of farce but like for these guys that go out and go on a boat and pay instagram models to go there like the <laughs> smv is is tied into all those things or set your access to sex uh from a varying factors but yeah being hot is one of them being like again being hot the subjectivity of that is so funny because all these guys pumping iron think that girls want some arnold but most of them are like yeah like i've dated my boyfriend for 10 years and he's like chubby and shit but like when we cuddle it doesn't feel like i'm holding a bag of like bones and that's <laughs> yeah. kind of nice holding about of chicken breasts or whatever so yeah just to interject but the interjection was perfect let's 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 make it like as clear as possible as clear cut as possible because uh, I, I don't know i'm fucking intrigued and and you you know the depths of this uh, of this fucked up shit so i am uh, i am random guy who you know is not getting laid and i get into this sort of uh uh rabbit hole uh what kind of shit walk me through it am i going to be told that i need to do you just just imagine right now that you're you're an andrew tate and uh tell me what i need to do in order to become uh it doesn't have to be specifically andrew tate but that type of rhetoric what i need to do in order for me to finally become the best most dominating version of myself noah teach me master yes i will be your red pill guru um i'm gonna hear steel man the red pill because i think i i tend to to use it use more charitable terms a lot of times when there's so so much wrong with it but the steel man edition of red pill advice is get in the gym do something physical to improve your body like don't be fat essentially be somewhat attractive so that women when they see you on a dating app scientifically statistically using calculations and algorithms you have determined that you might be able to get a match also with that like optimizing your dating profile where you you have good photos and you're not like you're not creeping people out with your photos and you're not i mean yeah there's just like tips like that Mm -hmm. when it comes to dating um but also i think the making money aspect having finite capital disposable income because it's there's a lot of traditionalist stuff going on a date and paying for the woman being able to do that um them damn women them never pay the bill am i right <laughs> <laughs> but yeah there, there's that as well where it's like they're like you'll it's nonsensical it's it's a self-contradictory worldview because you'll see that like oh the way to find a high value woman is to be a gentleman courteous we're going to do this traditional thing but then 
every other TikTok is men complaining about doing like the women are double standards because they complain about blah, blah, blah. They're just explaining patriarchy and complaining about it while endorsing the patriarchy. Yeah. And so yeah. it, it's it's like, yeah, so sorry to deviate from the steel man. But I think it, those are really big, like money, finances, physical attract and just a- aesthetics and then surrounding yourself with other like mind, like that grind set stuff that we we're talking about. Um, I think that's a big part of it. Also, there's the element of like if you get into the more bleak communities of like the black pill, the incel type stuff. Obviously, this isn't necessarily self improvement. Although some like one thing a lot of these black belt channels will recommend is like jawline surgery or like oh, Botox and like skull shaving. Not actually skull <laughs> shaving, but like w- shit like that because of the sort of it's basically genetic inability to reproduce, which is kind of an oxymoron, but the, it's it's saying you have no hope. And yeah. if you get into that, you know, it's possible to get back out into the self-improvement stuff, but all of it relies on, you know, misogyny, right? It's, it relies on either getting women so you can fuck them and then eventually use one to like reproduce or you will never get women because they think you're ugly because they just want to fuck the muscular guy and so you should give up and like kill yourself it's it's not great but those are the two general paths and i mean when when we're talking about like self-improvement i tend to like acknowledge that strong that seal man where it's like this stuff you know is sometimes good to help people out but uh, but also that like falls short in the systemic analysis of how many people are actually being helped by this and on, on a broad scale yeah what are we doing focusing on this when we could be focusing on like political action and ways to alleviate these sorts of things through you know large scale education improving education systems to account for these sorts of things i i, I feel like one thing that's that i've done short and what a lot of people do is is um, online is even if you're progressive, you're falling into the internet culture aspect and not looking at the broader economic and uh, societal governmental context. And and so, yeah, like red pill stuff is quote unquote good for certain things. But that goodness, I think we could for sure do better to like uh, frame that goodness in a context that it's a hyper online culture that will only affect a small select group of people. And for the vast majority of them that either don't have access to this or see it and are unsuccessful in like climbing the corporate ladder or making money or going to the gym, it's not going to work out. And so it's not this end all be all solution. But at the same time, I guess like it hel- it doesn't hurt to acknowledge. Yeah, like it's in terms of Internet culture self-improvement generally speaking is good but it's jordan peterson shit like it's like this isn't going to work for everybody so yeah because it's because it's hijacked they they, they yeah. take self-improvement and then they uh pitch it as again not to repeat ourselves but as a as a form of you to you know eat your opponents and sit on the uh, throne of skulls uh, it, but you know they always forget to mention that if everybody's eating everybody else and everybody's fighting everybody else uh, the thrones made of skulls get bigger but uh, in number they get smaller and smaller and less and less people get to sit in it so sure well, most people you know that don't have particular disabilities can you know get in shape and then work and you know get very fit but the second aspect of you know get rich uh, very, very few of those trying to achieve that uh, that kind of uh, plateau are going to get there. And it's even, to me, it's like so funny. It's like, I don't know, like didn't like every fucking parent tell this to their kid, like son or daughter, you need to be uh, rich and you need to be good looking. And this is, this is going to make your life easier. <laughs> like, like at the end of the day, cut from everything. That's kind of the philosophy, which like, duh, like, like, what you know what would be good if uh, I woke up one morning and uh, they told me that I get to go on a train and go to a magic wizardly place and all of a sudden I find out I'm like a guy that's supposed to fight this bald dude with no nose and like we're all wizards and shit it's all if if <laughs> if, if 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 like uh, it's, um, it's just based yeah, on fucking just to no mention solution. like the yeah. um like this is what your dad and mom should have been telling you or or probably would have been telling you. I think either because kids weren't told that or because they were and they forgot or they were and they didn't take it seriously or whatever else they were and they deviated from that because of social groups or whatever. That's why Jordan Peterson, someone like that, is all these people's, all these men's dad. Like yeah. he is functionally adhering to a dad father figure and telling you to clean your room blah 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 but you know it's yeah it's been said countless times that that is um 
a weird way to interact with an online like self-help guru is to think he's your dad or to to channel on the sort of this is my father and i need guidance because men lack guidance or whatever but again you know men do lack guidance in a lot of ways it's just Mm -hmm. paying for a lecture is is not like necessarily a, a widespread solution to that problem so Exactly. And especially because it uh, dissuades you from class consciousness and the true understanding of what, where the most problems of the world stand from and which is the dominion of 1000, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But uh, we, can, we can, this, this has been a, br- a brutally uh, beautiful conversation. But, uh, you know, throughout it, you know, we, we all like ritually took our dicks out and we were pissing on men. So uh, obviously we're not, I'm kidding. But uh, we can kind of Some finish, of like finish on a relatively positive <laughs> note. Uh, I have my takes, but what what is non toxic masculinity for you, Noah? Or an even better question, like, is it even a thing? So the first step to answer that question is to acknowledge that masculinity is an aesthetic. It's a construct and an aesthetic. And so a man, like, what makes a man? What are masculine traits? Uh, strength, leadership, uh, whatever else. The ones you know, like the, those are all things that, you know, a human can possess. And so socialized into us is is the idea and role that a man's going to be take the lead and a woman's going to follow when that's not always the case. And so from that, you can derive that masculinity is when basically is when a man does those things, even though it's traditionally associated with those things and femininity is traditionally associated with like submissive, like beauty, uh, caring, motherly nature, all those things. And so you know, a man can take those aesthetics and take those actions and use them in a number of ways. Like a man could take uh, strength and use it to beat his wife, or he could take strength and use it to like work hard to support his family. And so I think even though masculinity is a construct, like it has to be acknowledged that a lot of people are always going to adhere to that. And Mm -hmm, also that it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, Like obviously people derive meaning from a sense of masculinity. And so feeling like you are a provider and like you're a good father because you're teach like you're teaching your sons to you know work hard and you're teaching your daughters to again like there's bad stuff there like teaching your daughters to to just be uh like submissive whatever else there's harmful stuff there but still like you can be a good man Mm -hmm. and even though the definition of a good man is pretty subjective it's like if people are going to be identifying with it anyways that just means not using that you know masculinity uh for wrong to harm people to uphold a hierarchy and like we were talking about earlier like a traditional household doesn't have to be uh uh, stressed onto a hierarchy of domination it can be stressed onto you know a a like mutual sort of um beneficial community loving yeah community exactly but then you know a man being a part of that community and displaying the aesthetics isn't on its own uh harmful but you know it very often is connected to that so i think something like that absolutely and that i think would be a, a very nice uh spot uh to finish Uh, this uh, brilliant episode on Uh, everyone listening uh, you know take that um, toxicity and uh, melt it into some uh, uh, proper uh, unadulterated reactionary masculine (laughs) uh, behavior Uh, thank you Noah so much uh, for coming on I think this will be a very useful uh, episode especially for our uh, younger, struggling uh, male audience, but uh, uh, also for uh, the women out there, uh, if there are already, of course there are, we look at our statistics, but uh, because they will hear the other side of the coin and kind of what, um, why more and more men are becoming uh, these fucking insane baboons listening to, because they're listening <laughs> to even more insane baboons pitching them stuff that's uh, basically regurgitated neo-fascist propaganda to one extent or the other. But with that being said, uh, once again, thank you, Noah, so much for coming on. Could you please, again, just say where people can find you, et cetera, et cetera. Plug. Yeah, uh, on my YouTube is just my name, Noah Sampson, and you can follow me on Twitter. It's uh, my ad is LMS4TBH. Yeah, those are the only things I really use. So um, 
thank you guys so much for having me. This was great and huge fan. So excited to listen to this and remember how smart and cool I and my and my <laughs> good friends are on the D program podcast. So um, yeah, thank you. You absolutely are. And usually we lie to our guests about this. No, not usually, but sometimes. <laughs> but with you, actually, I think JT is going to have a brilliant time editing this. I really, really, really motivate everyone to check out the the links in the description of be it the the, the video or the seven hundred different podcast platforms that you uh, that you might be using because Noah's uh, Noah's work is very important and just uh, subjectively, objectively, very good. Uh, with that being said, thank you to everyone who supports us on Patreon. If you're considering uh, supporting us and allowing us to stay as independent as possible, not spamming you with uh, sponsors or working for this George Soros or the other, because uh, now there's a son apparently and he like fired 40% of open <laughs> society, but sorry, yeah. Uh, please consider uh, donating over on Patreon. You can get access to this lovely Discord community. You can get early uh, episodes and you can get completely 100% exclusive episodes uh, through supporting us as well as uh, in the higher tiers even uh, you know hanging out with uh, with our stupid asses uh, once a month all right thank you as always you got Nick, for that beautiful plug for our, our our lovely patrons thanks everyone for listening this has been a, a fantastic episode of the d program hope you enjoyed i know we did noah thanks again for coming on this has been the d program i'm jt i'm you got Nick. and i uh... <laughs> <laughs> this whole time I've been this cough has been with my ass and I'm no oh voice crack too give me a second <laughs>